Good afternoon, everyone. Can you guys hear me? Yes, hearing you. Okay, great. Um, can we bow our heads and close our eyes for prayer this afternoon? Thank God and heaven, Reverend Father, Lord, I just want to thank you for this year, Holy Sabbath day. I want to thank you for bringing everyone to this online broadcast. I hope that it is a blessing to all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. It is my pleasure to welcome each and every one to our AY program. Today's team is entitled David, Great Faith, Great Giant Faith, sorry, Giant Paul. I pray that your sitting with us is warm and enjoyable. Keynote, please pay attention to every feature that comes across your screen, as well as every word that is said. There are hidden clues throughout the program. Back to the tech team for the preliminary activities. Good night, everyone, and please join us as we sing. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote the sacred head for someone such as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Was it for crimes that I have done? He suffered on the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. But drops of grief can never repay the debt of love I owe. And Lord, I give myself away. This all God I can do. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Oh, when the sweet by and by. We shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by. We shall meet on that beautiful shore. We shall sing on that beautiful shore the melodious songs of the blessed. And our spirit shall sorrow no more. Not a sigh for the blessing of rest. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. In the sweet by and by, we 
shall meet on that beautiful shore. Make a song of joy and gladness. Did the bring your noblest things? Banish every thought of sadness, pouring forth your highest praise. Sing to him whose care has brought us once again with friends to meet. And whose loving voice has taught us of the way to Jesus' feet. Wake the song, wake the song, the song of joy and gladness. Wake the song, wake the song, the song of jubilee. Joyfully with songs and banners, we will greet the festal days. Shout aloud all glad hosannas and the grateful homage pay. We will chant our Savior's glory while our thoughts we raise above, telling still the old old story, precious the redeeming love. Oh, make the song, make the song. The song of joy and gladness. Wake the song, wake the song, the song of jubilee. Down to the Holy Father for the mercies of the May each heart as here we gather, swell with gratitude since then. to thee, O love, for redemption through thy blood. Breathe upon us, Holy Spirit. Sweet peace, draw us near to God. Wake the song, wake the song, the song of joy and gladness. Wake the song, wake the song, the song of jubilee. Go oh, sing them. The AY AIM, the Advent message to all the world in my generation. The motto, the love of Christ compels me. The pledge, loving the Lord Jesus, I promise to take an active part in the Advent Youth Society, doing what I can do to help others and to finish the work of the gospel in all the world. The law, the law is for me to keep the morning watch, do my honest part, care for my body, keep a level eye, be courteous and obedient, walk softly in the sanctuary, keep a song in my heart, and go on God's errand. Adventist youths are we from every land and sea. Together we pray and work and play in happy harmony. We have our faith to share with others everywhere. A message of love from God above to show the world we care. Adventist youth, Adventist youth, Adventist youth.
Good afternoon, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Good afternoon, yes, loud and clear. Okay. Um, so this evening's icebreaker challenge is a short game of Would You Rather? And everyone is welcome to participate. I hope you enjoy the game. So, well, I'll explain. The, we have four scenarios this evening, and with each scenario, you have a choice of what you would rather do. I'll just dive right in. Whilst walking the road, you see a defenseless person being harassed. Would you continue walking and mind your business, or would you help the person? Feel free to respond in the chat or unmute and Someone said, call the police. <laughs> okay. Moving on. Would you rather minister, to, would you rather do ministry work in a community where crime and illegal drug trafficking is on the rise or would you rather do ministry work in a peaceful community? Okay, so we have tech support with crime and drug trafficking on the rise, peaceful community, illegal drug place, peaceful again. I love this response, where God sends, amen. Okay. I'm barely getting much focal responses here. After a tiring exercise session, your gym instructor offers to give you a lift while on the way home, he or she puts his or her hand on your upper thigh. Would you rather put a stop to it immediately or would you just pretend nothing happened? Box him in the throat. <laughs> These Christian answers. <laughs> Box him in his throat. I will them immediately. Okay. It would be safe to jump out of a moving car, but. Ooh. Run away when the car stops. Okay. And the last question this evening is. You are doing a research project and your phone dies. You ask your friend if you can use their laptop or well, their device and they give you their laptop and you find some interesting, inappropriate content. Do you ask them about it or do you just pretend you saw nothing? How is it none of your business, Gideon Shallow? Depending on what it is, I don't know if it's a pop up. I don't know if it's a gateway 
all I know is, is not my device. I should not be snooping. No, but this is your close friend. Don't you think you should seek to find out if they need your assistance in any way possible? Well, if it's my close friend, I shall bring them the laptop. But if it's someone I don't know, nothing. I, I just go and ignore that nonsense. Okay. Nicolette said, I think I should ask them about it, but depending on the content, I might just leave it alone. Maybe talk to their friend or parent or someone and ask them to reach out and help. I could work with that answer. Tell their parents. Okay. I will now pass over to Kristen McNeil. Bye, everyone. Bye. Good afternoon, everyone. You all hearing me? Yeah, it's coming through. There. One, two, three. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's EY again. I'll be your host for this afternoon's program. And we, the Inverse Sabbath School quarterly class of Cleveland Temple, has the responsibility of, well, we, we are responsible for the AY today, right? So at, at this point in time, I'm going to pass you over to the tech team for the special music of this afternoon. Hear the sound of a mighty rushing wind, and it's closer now than it's ever been. I can almost hear the trumpet as Gabriel sung the call at a midnight cry. We'll be going. I look around me, I see prophecies fulfilled everywhere, the signs of the time, they are pairing everywhere, and I can almost hear the Father. said son go get my children get my children how to midnight cry we'll be going home when jesus steps up Cry. 
we'll be going home. I look around me, I see prophecies fulfilled everywhere all around me. The signs of the time They are appearing everywhere And I can almost hear the Father As he said, son, go get my children Get my children, oh the midnight cry the bride of Christ will rise when Jesus steps out on the cloud to call his children the dead and cursed Amen. Good afternoon, folks, once again, and welcome to those who would have recently joined our program. Anybody could unmute their mic and just tell me what is the name of today's program. You can literally see their screen share. What is today's program? This is secretly a mic check. <laughs> what is today's program, anyone? David, giant faint, Kate, giant Paul. Dry and fade, dry and fall, right, David? So as you guys see today, we are looking at the life of David, right? And from the picture that, picture that we have on screen, we will be focusing on two aspects of David's life. Now, we know that these two events are not the only events of David's life, but for the purposes of today's program, we'll be focusing on or highlighting those two instances, right? So can anybody look at the left picture and depict 
what aspect of David's life would be represented. You could type it in chat, you could unmute and just blurt it out. That, that sort of silhouette picture, what does that represent? Um, that picture on the left is when David was fighting Goliath. All right, amen. Anybody else, any other ideas of what that picture could represent? A fight and attempt. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. speeding ahead. I actually left picture. <laughs> All right, so the right picture. What what do y'all think that what story does that represent? The picture on the right. Is that Samson and Delilah? David and Bathsheba. David and Bathsheba, correct. All right, so. Welcome to those on YouTube as well. I'm seeing uh, Judith Griffith and uh, Anthony Joseph as well, all right? So now we're gonna go on to our scripture reading. Um, mind, don't mind me as I try to navigate these screens at the same time. All right, so we're gonna start with our scripture reading and please have your Bibles on standby because we are gonna be looking at a lot of scripture today. All right, so here's our first scripture reading. Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Sabbath. And this evening's AY scripture reading is taken from 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 8. And it reads, Then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. All right, so we want to thank Kyle for, oh, yeah. We want to thank Kyle for that rendition of the scripture reading for to be. And now, I'm just going to put your, I'm going to allow you all to look at this particular page. What does the S word stand for? What does it mean? Anybody could unmute, you could type in chat. What's that? What does that S word mean? S-T-A-T-I-S-T-I-C. Yeah, statistics. statistics. So when, when, when you hear statistics, what comes to mind? When you hear about statistics, what comes to mind? Facts, numbers. Facts, mm -hmm. Facts numbers. Yeah. Do you think opinion when you hear statistics? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um. Okay. So as as you see here, the display statistics, facts over opinion, <laughs> right? So unless your opinion is rooted in facts, then it has more weight, right? Um. Mm -hmm. So we will look at evidence, we look at proof, and we look at references. So that is why we have been encouraging you all to have your Bibles and a Google on stand by okay so now we're gonna have a sort of um statistical or referencing going on right so let's pay attention to this video all right so you're seeing it right but it's a still image right now all right here we go here are seven facts about david from the bible one David was the youngest of seven sons. Two, David was very attractive as a youth. Three, David was from Bethlehem. Four, David was Ruth's and Boaz's grandson. Five, David's best friend was Jonathan. Six, David had a reputation for success in war. 7. David has 73 psalms attributed to him, according to Jewish and Protestant tradition. Psalms 3, Psalms 4, Psalms 5, Psalms 6, and the list goes on.
All right, so we want to thank Precious for that video that she edited and gave us. That was wonderful. So y'all, y'all, y'all got the gist of what 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 are we talking about when we we reference and if anybody noticed anything special about the video. Anybody notice anything about those seven facts that were listed in the video? Take a type in chat. <laughs> they were narrated by Precious, yes. <laughs> they could as you could unmute. Did y'all like the video? What was the most interesting fact to you? Number one, two, three, four, five or seven. I think um, him being along the lineage, lineage, sorry, of Ruth and Boaz. They were real humans and not cartoon. Yeah. So you liked how it was not, um, I guess, <laughs> animated. Yeah, like the the use of real life pictures to to each point, right? Is that what you're saying, Miss Collins? Yes. Okay. Amen. Okay, so we're gonna do a little activity at this time, right? So let me let me just state it. Today we are not doing a traditional or general presentation on the life of David. We are actually going to do a sort of active or live study of the life of David with the two aspects being the life of Goliath, oh, sorry, David versus Goliath and David versus Bathsheba. So according to the first um, scripture reading that we would have had, we are now going to focus on the life of David with respect to his battle at well with Goliath, right? So we're going to do a little role play activity right now and at this time i am going to be a panelist and i'm going to invite another panelist to the stage at this time miss nicolette are hi you <laughs> yeah i'm here all right hi <laughs> hi nicolette so today we are going to conduct a live interview with all the participants in the chat is that correct Yes, sir. Yes, we are right. And tell me, what 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 are we looking for today? Without 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 spilling too much information. <laughs> um. Well, we are trying to find David in a nutshell. Yeah, we're um, trying to find David. Yeah. Well, the real David, please stand up. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, I guess. Go ahead. So, which one? So like how, okay, so you want to like tell us what is the order or like how are we going to do this particular interview? Yes. So essentially, we are going to ask some questions and present some ideas. And we want you as the congregation to respond to them, um, to answer them, but and prove to us that you are quote unquote David, but with evidence. We want some facts to back you up and by facts we mean scriptural evidence as well <laughs> <laughs> because we know that anything in the bible is true all scripture is given by inspiration of god so for these questions we want you to not only answer us with your intellect and reasoning but also to give some biblical evidence to back up your claims and at the same time remember we are role playing so it's an activity that will help us enjoy the experience and well, learn something at the same time. So if you could put on your David voice or your, 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 your best David impression as you answer the questions, that will be uh, really appreciated, not so? A hundred percent, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, so I, I think I have a... And, and is everybody um, understanding what is what is going to be taking place so far? Let's have a dry run and let's see. All right. So I am we are looking for David. So this is the interview for David to face Goliath. All right. So all our questions are centered around looking for David to face Goliath. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. 
I, I have a first question. Who is David? No, 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 never say it like this. Are you David? David, where are you? Hey. Oh, hi, David. Hello. Okay, are you David? Is your name David? No, but I will be David. Oh, you will be David. So how, 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 how do we know that you are David? I am brave. You are brave. Um, like David. You're brave like David. Um, hmm. Nicola, do you believe this is David? I mean, I think bravery was a, a big part of the David's character that I know, but I think I'm going to need a little bit more than that to know some more evidence, to know who was David. How, how are you, David? I think I need some yeah. more proof. Yeah, like, this could be an imposter. <laughs> are you David? Yes, I am David. And how I, do we know that you're David? Is it is it, do you have any specific information that could valid? Like I know they didn't have ID cards back then, no? They didn't have ID cards no, back then. No. But like like how did they relate to each other back then? Well, they were close because Jesse is their father. Okay. I think he's on the right track, but I feel like we need some evidence. Oh, yeah. Some evidence. In, in that I, sense, meaning some scriptural evidence, anything in your Bible, what text do you think? And feel free, anybody in the chat or with your mics on, a text that speaks to Jesse being their father and their relationship among the brothers. A hint. Go to First Samuel. I won't tell you anything after that. But some biblical scriptures that speak to who David was. So like a response would be like, I am David. Look at First Samuel. Da, 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 da. And we will, we, will, we, will, we will verify that you are David. Speaking of which, I think someone on the YouTube chat, I think this was in response to um, the video. They were saying that, Jesse had eight sons, not seven, and referenced 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 12. Do you mind finding it for us, Kristen? Okay, so we're looking at chapter 12, verse 12, sorry. Now David was the son of Ephratite of Bethlehem in Judah, named Jesse, who had eight sons. Yes. Great, so that's, I think, the first fact so, that we've seen backed up. I think the fact the fact meant was like he had seven brothers. Mm -hmm. All right, so he's the youngest of eight, but he had seven brothers. So thus far, we know that David was not an only child; <laughs> that he was indeed the son of Jesse, who was an Ephrathite of Bethlehem. So we know where he lived, and we know that he was one of Jesse's eight sons. Any other facts anyone would like to contribute about David, giving some insight as to who he was, just within the context of David and Goliath and before that, not after. We don't want to jump ahead of ourselves. I see, but we role playing. Are you David? Tell, tell us. You yes. are okay, <laughs> a slayer of beasts. No, no, no. You, oh, you are a slayer of peace. David. Yes, David. You are David. He's a slayer of beasts. So I am a slayer of beasts. Okay. Nice. Mm -hmm. And your uh, evidence to back that up? I will get back to you soon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we have that on the, the pin board. So we know his family, and now we're hearing something about him being a slayer of beasts. Does that, anyone that, have... that is, You don't think that is uh, interesting hobby to have? <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't consider it a hobby. Hopefully it was only under like necessary conditions. Only. But I mean, remember we look into uh for David to face Goliath. So I, I think that would mm -hmm. really go well for the um qualifications. The experience. Yeah. Uh-huh. If only we could back up that information. Where do we, we have find? any scriptures to tell us that David was indeed a slayer of beasts? Again, hint, hint, First Samuel, you're in the chapter already, so just keep <laughs> keep going through there. 
I mean, I think the only the only hobby. Is, um, oh, go ahead, I have David. I have scriptures to back up. Oh, um, hi, David. First Samuel chapter seventeen verse thirty four. But All David right. said to Saul, "Your servant used to keep his father's sheep, but when a lion or a bear came to came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went after it and struck it." and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it rose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck it and killed it. Excuse me, David. Yes. Would you mind repeating the um, location of the text? Um, First Samuel chapter 17, verse 34 to 35. Oh, 34, 34. Okay, so David. Yes. Um, that is so, me. So, so we can confirm that you are a slayer of beasts, correct? Yes, I am. Mm -hmm. All right, so we appreciate your honesty. Are they, do you have any other, on any other hobbies, David? Well, my next hobby I have is playing the harp. Mm, interesting, musician. Yes. Uh, uh, like, like, and any way you can back this up? Um, I shall come back to you. Sure, David. I love that. I love how everyone's, you know, they're saying the fact that they're like, I'll get back to you on how to um, back it up. But before anyone else comes in to find a scripture in the Bible saying um, how, how you know that David was a musician, I see uh, our friend in the chat saying David was the youngest of the sons of Jesse, of the eight sons of Jesse. And they're also saying that he was a shepherd boy all interesting facts. So I think in what David just read in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 34 and 35, we can see that he was a shepherd boy because it says your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. And um, in terms of him being the youngest, I guess we may have touched on that before. I can't remember exactly. But those are two points in the chat there. Okay, so we have from YouTube, Judith, um, reference in this text, yes? First Samuel 16, 11. Then Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? And he said, there remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, go send and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes. Hmm. All right, so, so, so David um, is... Yes, I am back. Ahead. Oh, hi, David. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 18, which says, Then one of the servants answered and said, Look, I have seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite, who was a skillful in playing, a mighty man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech and handsome person, and the Lord is with him. Amen. I mean, well done, David. Uh -huh. We 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 can prove that you are David. So there's no there's no doubt this guy is David, correct? Yes. Yeah. All right. So Nicolette, any any do you do you are you ready to test David here? Yeah, I'm ready to test all the Davids that are online right now. So thus far, we've seen that David was the son of Jesse of Bethlehem. He was the youngest of eight sons. He was a shepherd boy. He was a skillful musician, and we also saw that he was a slayer of beasts, as Brother Haynes put it, um, slaying the lion and the bear um, where his sheep were acquired. So I'm sure we're all familiar with the story of David and Goliath. Everything that we're getting, everything that we're talking about is coming straight from the Bible. We're backing it up. So Christian... Kristen, sorry, do you mind finding first time we'll chapter 17, verse 4 to 7? I know we're not supposed to give them the evidence, but there's something that I want to ask David about a certain scenario that was happening. First Samuel chapter 17, verses 4 to 7. And I'll ask someone if they can read it. Uh David. Ask David to read it. Yeah. David, aka Kyla. <laughs> can you read that text for us?
1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 4 to 7. If not that, David, another David. Oh. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a stack. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze, and he had bronze armor on his legs, and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and his shield bearer went before him. Thank you very, very much, Kyla. So this far we see a little description of Goliath, a champion who it says um, measured six cubits in a span, which in about in today's measurements is about 9.75 feet. Um, they detailed his armor. It was completely crafted from bronze and he weighed greatly. Then it said he defied the armies of Israel for 40 days and maybe not in that particular extract. Um, I have a question. He was truly giant. Yes. So I have a question. This is at war. David is a shepherd boy. He's supposed to be tending to his father's sheep. Oh, we should say you, David. Uh, yes, thanks. You, sorry. David. You, David, yes. are supposed to be tending to your father's sheep in Bethlehem at home. And then the Bible speaks of this huge giant, Goliath. So the question I have for David is, how did you end up at the battlefield seeing Goliath? And, well, I'm sure you can tell us what happens after that. How did David end up there? How did you get here? <laughs> well, I ended up there because, well, I was tending my father's flock, but then he told me to carry food for my brothers who are currently at the camp and then when i went there i saw goliath taunting them hmm. so yeah you, you have a text message that's about how that i ended up at the camp does it do you have a text message for that conversation <laughs> can anyone suggest a text that backs up that point we want to make sure that everything we're saying is backed up by scriptural evidence that we're all on the same page so is there a scripture to back that up how did you get here david <laughs> where's your invitation <laughs> all the bible scholars i suggest you scourge first samuel chapter 17 they'll find something so how did here. david end up on the battlefield yeah first hey, samuel did, chapter 17 how did you get here Any David could answer. Any David. I said, remember the purpose of this exercise is for us. To um, okay, go ahead. First, I have one. First Samuel chapter 17, verse 14 to 15, which says, David was the youngest. David was the youngest and old, but David returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at that year. Okay. I think in the, in the chat. chat. Yeah. yeah. You can go ahead and read what no, they you, said. You, you go ahead. You go ahead. Oh. <laughs> okay. So there was one David saying, I went to carry food for my brothers. And then there's a scripture verse being highlighted. First Samuel chapter 17, verses 17 to 20. Um, the person who suggested it, do you want to read it for us, please? Oh, okay. All right. So first Samuel 17, 17 to 20, I see uh, the next David is saying to 24. So we'll see. Um, it says, then Jesse said to his son, David, take now for your brothers and Ephah, New King James Version, 
of this dried grain and these ten loaves and run to your brothers at the camp and carry then ten cheeses to the captain of their thousand and see how your brothers fare and bring them back news of them. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. So David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with the keeper and took the things and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the camp as the army was going out to fight and shouting for the battle. And well, I guess it goes on to say 21, for Israel and the Philistines had drawn up in battle array, army against them. And David left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper, ran to the army and came and greeted his brothers. So I'll end in verse 22 for now. Thank you so much. So that's how we know that he ended up there. But um, assuming that we're all familiar with the story of David and Goliath, we see that he's um, he's on the he's gone to give food to his brother under the instruction of his father. As you can see in um, verse um, verse 15, he went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's sheep at Bethlehem. So it was a custom for him to go to the battlefield, go back home, bringing food to his brothers under the direction of his father. So um, when David got to the battlefield, just jumping ahead a bit in the story, we see that he saw what was going on with this big giant that we described before that was Goliath. And he saw how he had the Philistines in great peril, if you read on in the chapter, if you read on in the verse. And we know, according to the story, that he volunteers to fight him. However, a question arises it for in my mind for David there. Um, if we read First Samuel chapter 17, verses verse 25, just verse 25 for now, um, I'll ask Caleb, David, can you read? Yes. <laughs> can you read that verse for me? First Samuel chapter 17, verse 25. Okay. So the man of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel, and it shall and it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches, and will give his daughter and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. Thank you very much. And I want someone else to read um first samuel chapter 17 verse 28 anyone who's willing first samuel chapter 17 verse 28 this is just to build the foundation for the question i'm about to ask first samuel chapter 17 verse 28 anyone can read any david can read Oh dear. And oh. Eliab, and Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down and thou, that thou mightest see the battle. Thank you very, very much. So we've seen that there is a Goliath. He's challenging the armies of Israel. He's a very intimidating, huge giant. And then we see that there is a reward for the person who kills this giant. So the question is, were David's intentions in fighting Goliath noble? He asked them to repeat the rewards that the one who is victorious over Goliath would receive twice um, we read run one point, and then there's another in, a, in another verse. Once when he had just come, and again after Eliab's reprimand, um, how have you pronounced it, Eliab, Eliab. Um, does this give insight into where his mind laid, where David's mind laid? Was he willing to fight Goliath because he wanted um, the riches, and because he was indeed conceited as his brother suggested? Or was there another reason for him? 
deciding to fight Goliath. And I would like you to find a scripture to back up your claim. But if you don't have one and you want to illustrate your thoughts, feel free to contribute and we can find a scripture later on. But the question is, were David's intentions noble in deciding to fight Goliath? Oh, are your intentions noble? <laughs> are your intentions noble? Thank you. Uh, uh, I have not found the scripture yet, but I will express my thoughts. The other reason that I wanted to fight Goliath is because he was disrespected by God. No one does that. And since also the king was given a reward to whoever kills him, I said, it's best I just prove my God is not weak. And also get a reward. So you're saying that it was kind of like a two in one deal of that. <laughs> he yes. wanted to <laughs> he wanted to stand for God and you know there's a reward, so why not get that one time? Okay. Yes. Um if you want to type your response, we're looking at the YouTube congregations chat and we're reading the chat in Zoom as well. So anyone else wants to answer the question or give some insight as to why did David decide to fight Goliath? Was it out of conceit? Was it out of greed for riches? Or was there another reason? Um, this person, Caleb, just said that he didn't like that Goliath was defying God. Sorry, David said that he didn't like that Goliath was defying God. Anyone wants to expand on that or give another reason? But David, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in that response. So David was like, this guy is disrespecting his God, right? And he decides to go and fight. This this reminds me of another fella. I think his name was Joshua, right? Yeah, like, like jo remember when Joshua had his first battle? Did Joshua lift a finger? I don't think Joshua lifted a finger. Joshua basically walked and made, made a march, yeah? Not so? So what so are you trying to imply? I'm, I'm asking David, why do you think this situation called for you to go to war? Why, why you didn't you just go back and turn your ship? Good question. Because I said it before, I didn't go back to my ship because as I was carrying the food for my brothers, I heard that he was also terrorizing the Israelites and disrespecting my God. So, well, my brother told me to go back, but I decided to not go back and tell the king that I want to fight Goliath. Okay, anyone else has a contribution that they'd like to make on this issue? Where is Reasons Noble? And did he indeed have to fight? Could he have left it in the hands of the Lord? Do you think that was God's intention? Yeah, I'm like, I'm like David. David, why do you think you are the one? Why, why were you the one to go? And there are not many fierce warriors in the Israelite camp. Well, I went because I apparently was the only one that was apparently going to stand up for God because all the other Israelites were just hiding. All right. So th they were afraid. Look, look at the text right here. I, f I, found, I found evidence for you. <laughs> all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were much afraid. That's an admirable... That is an admirable quality of you, David. Yeah, and as we had established from the beginning, when he asked, when he asked about a characteristic of David, he did say that he was brave. I think another piece of evidence to support him saying that David, um, his desire didn't necessarily land in trying to receive a reward, but in standing for God is First Samuel chapter seventeen, verse twenty-six. If you can, if you can show it there for us, highlight it. And it says, and David said to the men who stood by him, what shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? So that was him asking about the rewards. But the next part of it says, for who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? So from that text, we can see a sense of passion in David. So not allow somebody to 
defy God, but to do what he believed should be done, to stand for God and show that what Goliath was claiming and what Goliath had said truly wasn't um, true, to stand for his God and show the truth, which required bravery, but also required something in his heart, um, a love for God that he wouldn't be okay with that. Not that the other soldiers were okay, but they were stricken by fear. Okay. So I think we run out of time for this particular interview. Are there any like final comments about the um, situation with David versus Goliath? And I, I know yes, that. Sir. Oh, hi, David. You have something to say? Yes, I believe God was setting up his his plan and setting up David to ascend the throne and making all see that this would be the potential or this would be the future king, not potential, but future king of of Israel. All right. So I believe that God had uh, a great deal to do with this in um, setting up this 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 act, this scenario, this whole play. All right, with David um, slaying Goliath, and you know, all seeing that this man killed his thousands, David is tens of thousands. All right, so I believe it was an act of God and the Holy Spirit moving upon David heavily to did to do what he did and to say what he said. You know, so that's my closing remarks for now. Amen. Thank you so much for that. I think. Um, I'm going to jump on the side of David, apart from the person answering the question, asking the questions, and also um, point something out. I think we often hear the phrase, it's easier said than done. We hear people say that all the time. And David, um, you can be filled with passion for a moment. Um, some things happen, say somebody, you have a sibling, and somebody wasn't kind to your sibling, they pushed your sibling down. Um, you might have felt, really filled with passion, filled with anger or whatever emotion you might be feeling to go and do something about it. But then when you go toward the person who's done such a thing and you see that they are 9.75 feet tall, maybe all the passion just goes away. It disappears. So also with David's bravery, I think something that we can note is his faith. If we look at First Samuel chapter 17, verses 45 to 47, I'm just going to read it from my Bible, which is NIV. In the New International Version, and it says, This day the Lord, this is David to Goliath, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. A little bit gruesome. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals. And this is the part that I wanted to highlight. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. So he pointed out previously that with Joshua, he didn't have to lift a finger in his first battle. And with David, yes, he did have to fight with his little slingshot against a, a, a heavily armored giant. But you saw his faith and you saw his intentions just from that first. He wanted to show the whole world that there is a God in Israel, not by him slaying Goliath or winning that battle, but showing that the Lord doesn't work just by these things. He's not going to save him by sword or spear, but the battle is the Lord's. So we can see that his faith allowed him to show or be a testimony of God working through his people to do his will and be triumphant. So I think that's something we can also note from David's bravery coupled mm -hmm. with his faith. Yeah, I think that be like well, this particular instance, it shows that God could work in different ways, right? So God God isn't limited to one specific course of action with regards to how he, he has his workers in our lives, right? And another thing that we could take from David versus Goliath is an analogy of Goliath himself, right? So we may not be faced with a six cubit um tall man, right? Or oh, monster beast. After all, we don't have experience slaying beasts, right? <laughs> but as you could see here um, in the definition for Goliath, other than it being the fact that it was a Philistine giant, because of its rep his reputation, 
he has been associated with a person or a thing of enormous size or strength, right? So it can literally be any situation that you think is too much for you. It could be an exam, it could be um, managing a household, it could be an interview, just like this interview right here. Anything that we think is too much for us, it is, or it can be considered a Goliath situation. But if we apply the principles, they were hard, right? If we demonstrate that faith and bravery and allow him to guide the stones that we um, fling from our slingshot figuratively, right? It's not to attack everybody who um, blaspheme God, right? But if we go to the situation and say, situation, you come before me with all these details, but I come before you in the name of the Lord. This is the Lord's battle, right? So it's it's not it wasn't it wasn't uh well as as K, is Kalem as Kalem see him is, is a is a two for one special like but your aim is the is special number one as in you're doing this for the Lord right not for the extra um, King Saul's wife yes. <laughs> All right, so we're just gonna pause for a while. Um, we're gonna look at the second, we're going on to the second half of our program, right? Okay, so we're back to the scripture reading and the second scripture reading is taken from. So Kyle, would you take it away? I'm talking as if Kyle is actually here. <laughs> the second scripture reading is taken from 2 Samuel chapter 11 and verse two. And it reads, then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. All right, so thank you, Kyle, who was here <laughs> with us. Thank you for that particular bit of information. Okay, so we, we, we're back to our statistics here all right um okay we're no longer doing this live interview we're doing something else oh we could find it um <laughs> i'm trying to close this okay here we go all right so we heard the scripture text. Now I am going to show you some statistics. I'm going to, we're going to look at some statistics, right? So, so this is the source of the information I'm going, I'm going to um, read for you here. So in an article entitled Attitudes Towards and Prevalence of Extramarital Sex and Description of Extramarital Partners in 21st Century, published in 2017. Interviews were conducted with a sample of the adult household population of the United States. So in this document, I'm gonna look, well, we are going to look at some interesting findings from that survey they conducted, right? So people mostly, or people most commonly reported for having extramarital sex with a close friend accounted for 53% of their um, of the um the sample size so 53% of the persons who responded to the survey reported to have extramarital sex with a close personal friend all right so th so that that's just the statistics we will go into it afterwards i'm just reading it to you. So the combined extramarital affair with either a neighbor, coworker, or long-term acquaintance accounted for 30%, right? So we have about 80% of the participants actually um, engaging in extramarital sex. Compared with, so an, another, another um, feature of the, um, the findings was that, oh, it's how many abstracts, somewhere here. Look at the figures over here. All right, so I handpicked, I handpicked the ones that were um, noteworthy. So compared with women, men were less likely to report that extramarital sex was always wrong and 
they were more likely to view it as either almost wrong, wrong sometimes, or not wrong at all. So you have more women believing that extramarital sex is always wrong than men. Right? So that's just an interesting statistic there. Another thing is that um, men were more likely to report past year and lifetime extramarital sex than women. And also men were more likely to report extramarital sex with someone they knew casually. All right, so I'm, we're gonna look at the second um, survey here. So we have this um, website called The Truth About Deception. And it's basically, so you could access this from the website. There are several findings that have been presented on extramarital affairs. And based upon the responses of the participants who complete this particular survey. So it's, it's like an ongoing survey. And we could see it like just looking at the um at the stats here, right? Most of the respondents in this particular survey are women. So like 66% or so two thirds, almost two thirds of the responses are women here, right? So one third is male. Okay, so. Look at the females' answers. So the question they were asked, have you ever had an emotional affair? And 90% of the females um, agreed to that, right? So 90% have had an emotional affair. Have they had a one night stand? Half of the females agreed and said, well, confirmed, sorry. Um, have they used any online service cheat on their spouse? A quarter of the females did. Have they engaged in cyber sex or as in chatting sexually with someone other than their spouse? 40% of women um, who answered the survey confirmed that. Have they cheated with someone their spouse knows? Almost half confirmed. Have they cheated because they were bored with their sex life? Almost a third. So you can see that the reason is kind of this is this reason is low. Um, but this this last reason for them cheating, I was faithful because of my of problems in my relationship. So this is a little bit interesting here. We can see that problems in their relationships attribute attributed to them cheating. I have considered leaving my spouse because of the sexual affair or encounter. So it's like a half-half situation, 50%. I have cheated in order to get even with my spouse, 30%. Hmm, um, I cheated on my spouse more than once, 50-50. At the time, I think my spouse suspected me of cheating less than likely, which is 40%. And my, sp my spouse found out the truth. So that's like 50%. So it's like... Is either you do or you don't, right? And look at the men's response now. 70% of men who answered the survey had an emotional affair. 70% of them had a one night stand. Let's compare that to women. So like more, more men than women had one night stands. I have, a, I have used an online service to cheat with my spouse, 21%. What do women look like? Okay, so it's actually not online, but like real life things going on. All right, so these these things have I cheated with someone my spouse knows least likely. I cheated because I bought my sex life least likely, and that 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 will that will that will play a, that will play that will play a role with how we answer David's question when we come back to um the discussion. I was on fatal be because of my problems in my relationship. So it's like a 50-50 thing here. I consider leaving my spouse because of the affair. Wow, very low. I have cheated in order to get even with my spouse. Very low, 15%. I cheated on my spouse more than once, 66%. Let's look at the, um. so 66% 66 of the men cheated on his spouse more than once. Um, it was it was a half half relationship for females. 
at the time my spouse suspected me of cheating, 21%, it's like it was undetectable. My spouse found out the truth, 38%. So it's like a lot, a lot of um a lot of cheating is going on recognized according to the um, survey here. So like with all the respondents, how did your spouse discover the truth? And you can see an overwhelming um, response would be, which was half of the responses was that they had confessed on their own, All right? So that's just that particular bit of statistical data. So sometimes when you hear discussions going on about X percent of men engage in X activity, this is how they um, acquired a bit of information, right? So now we, we, we're, going, we're going into a sensitive topic. Um, so this particular survey, is it a survey? Yeah. Yeah, um, that, that's what we're on. Right, so in a report released by, so I, I'm sharing an official document for you here, right? I could only show you certain pages of this, but it is entitled, Young People, Pornography, and Age Verifications. It was created in January 2020. Um, one thing about statistics, it's always important to find the most recent whenever you're trying to draw any conclusions. So 2020 is a relatively um, fresh year that we could sort of rely on these statistical bits. So in a report released by the British, so that BBFC stands for British Board of Film Classification. It's entitled Young People, Pornography and Age Verification in 2020. The following was stated about viewing or the viewing intentions with particular age groups. All right, so within this document, oh, you haven't seen anything. All right, so in this, in this document, you have certain sections, how do children come into contact with pornography? How do children use it as they get older? What motivates young people to watch it? What are the consequences of negative negative consequences of watching it? And what do adults and parents think about age verification? All right, so I'm gonna skip this particular page here. All right, so let's let's look at viewing intention. So among the group that said they had seen pornography, children in the youngest age group, which is 11 to 13, right? So as early as 11 years they were most likely to say that their viewing contact was mostly or all unintentional, right? So we have a, a little graph here. So the question that they asked is the children were in three different age groups. So we have a 11 to 13 age group, a 14 to 15 age group, as well as a 16 to seven age group. So the question they were asked, of all the pornography that you have seen, how much did you intentionally compare to seeing it by accident? Those who have seen pornography in brackets. All right, so, so the gray area is more intentional. The, the black area is mixed and more unintentional is blue. So between ages 11 to 13, 62% of the pornography that is seen is mostly unintentional, right? And you have, let me say, 30. <laughs> it's like I can't do my 37% of the, um, the population that was interviewed between 11 and 13. They sort of like look at, look at it on their own, right? And as an intentionally. So when we move to the age group graphic of 14 to 15, we can see the unintentional dropped to 53%, from 62 to 53. And the, the more intentional has actually increased as well, all right? So this particular graph um, percentage sort of stay the same. And as the grew older, from 16 to 17, unintentional started to go down to like 46%, right? So and the intentional went up, All right? So that's just the statistics I wanted to show just before we entered 
a live discussion. Okay. Is that the right thing? Yeah. Right. So I'll invite my panelists back on the point on the um, on the scene right now. So we are we are, we are having it, we move from an interview and it's more like a live discussion. You 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 can use scriptia to back up certain um, statements you may make, but we will allow opinions and experiences to be shared by you, right? So the question, we, we, ha we have a live discussion on the life of David and specifically with the story of Bathsheba. If you remember the scripture text that was taken from, all right, the scripture text that was taken from 2 Samuel 11 to 2 and it came to pass in the afternoon, David arose from his bed and he walked up on his roof and he saw a woman washing herself and he thought that she was very beautiful. So the question we're gonna start the discussion off with is, how can a modern day David avoid sexual temptation? You can refer, you can start by referring to the comments, um, the statistics, sorry, you could comment on the statistics that we'd have seen. And what we, what we, when we say a modern day David, we remember that we don't have David's kingly um, privileges. Right, but we want the reason why I place this, this, the um, statistics there for us to sort of realize that <laughs> there are things going on and we all have the temptation, sexual temptation that is around us. We can't ignore the statistics. Statistics are rooted in a huge sample of people and more than likely the statistics not lying. All right, so how can a modern day David avoid sexual temptation? I think while everyone in the chats or whatnot is getting their cells warmed up or typing their answers, I hope we're getting ready to meet their mics. I think something that we can keep in mind in terms of a modern day, day of modern day David or somebody in our world to avoid it, I think is to note that same text um second time chapter 11 instead of verse 2 but verse 1 um i'm gonna read from your screen it says in the spring of the year the time when kings go out to battle david sent joab and his servants with him and all israel and they ravaged the ammonites ammonites and besieged rabbah but david remained at jerusalem and i think something like that um, when asking the question, how can you avoid sexual temptation? I think that verse is really important because David was supposed to be at war with the rest of his army. He was supposed to be facing the Ammonites with them. He was king. He should have been there. But instead, for whatever reason, he chose to remain at Jerusalem. So I think at times in life, um, we should be somewhere or we should be doing something or in other words, you may have a God-given task um, that God knows he wanted us to have in order to keep us from stumbling, from falling, or from sinning. And David's mistake, I think one of his earliest mistakes in this situation was to not be carrying out that assignment that God had given him to go out with the rest of his army. Had he been there, he wouldn't have seen Bathsheba on the roof. He wouldn't have been taking glances at her, glances at her taking her little rooftop shower why she was on the rooftop god only knows um but i think if he was doing what he was supposed to be doing if he wasn't maybe idle in jerusalem that's like the first step to avoiding it so the persons who in the survey when they spoke about yeah like uncle Dwayne said in the chat there david is in the wrong place at the wrong time but not because of unforeseen circumstances, but clearly from choices that he had made to not have gone to war and to have been at home. I think from the statistics as we saw with those saying that they had seen it unintentionally, maybe if it was online based, maybe they were in today's day and age doing some schoolwork and it was online and some sites aren't 100% safe and something came up and they may have happened to behold something or to see something, but you're in the process of doing a task. So do you stop to continue looking at it or do you go to your task? So I think um, him being idle and not doing his God-given task, not 
doing what he was supposed to do kind of opened the door for temptation and for him indulging in something sinful that he shouldn't have been doing. Yeah, just to read the comments. So you want to read what Brother Waldron said in the chat there, Kristen? Me said no. Oh boy, pressure. <laughs> Come on, David. David was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yes, so true. Crazy sides popping up while you're just minding the business on the internet. I think, yeah, that's so true. Yeah, um, I don't know if I could um come in <laughs> with a point. Um, well, as you all know at AY, I'm like a real advocate for like you know watching clean content. You know, I truly believe that you know our eyes are the window to our soul. So, like whatever we put in, it stays there and it grows and you know it comes out as a a, a bigger baby <laughs> in the end, right? So. What we, what we look at, the kind of music that we listen to, you know, it feeds a certain beast within us, kind of similar to what we were talking about earlier today as well in church. So it's like, you can't expect to not, to avoid the enemy. And you're watching, like we are literally watching highly sexual content, you're literally listening to highly sexual music. That is what we will become after a while. Right. So because when we be whatever we behold, we'll be will eventually uh, morph into or change into. Right. Because that is what we are now placing as the mirrors in our lives. Right. So you can't be a CC Winans type Christian if you are putting Cardi B type music into you. Yo, airwise, come on. Right. Also, our movies. <laughs> They check. So if we do, I'm not saying all movies are bad. Obviously, we don't believe that in AY, right? But if we do choose to watch a movie, make sure it's not a movie that is going to, um, you know, arise a certain kind of sexual temptation within us so that when the temptation does come, it will be easier to perform because we have been in the classroom of lust. Dear Hollywood, we are looking at you. I love that phrase that you used, the classroom of West. That's that's really good. It's really deep because it's kind of like, as you said, um, you're training yourself. You're in there and you're beholding this, these things. And as a, a lesson pointed out, Proverbs 27, verse 20, the eyes of a man are never satisfied. So you're in the classroom of West. You're watching things. You're beholding certain things. I think that was a very, very good point. Thanks, Uncle Dean. Kristen, I see you have a text there. Are you going to? Um, as you always say, right? Um, as, as you always speaking, sorry. The, the, um, the statement, idle hands are the devil's workshop, came to mind. And I, I wanted to see if it was in the Bible. But, like, when I did research, it's like, it, it not, I mean, the concept is believable, not so. What like if if you don't um if you don't have an occupation then the devil will find you free right so the other tech uh, the other text that I could support that statement with would be um whatever your hand finds to do do it to the glory of God um so I'll just be finding text in the background and you, you could um like take the conversation. So any, anybody wanted to comment on these statistics that we um that we were looking at earlier? Do you think is how how early our children are exposed to graphic content? The percentages of extramarital affairs going on. What, what comes to mind? How as as Christians, how do you all sort of like um purpose in your heart how do you how do you purpose in your heart to avoid sexual temptation are there any specific texts that you um that you go to or your your your, your moral foundation with regards to um 
sexual um, temptation is surrounded on. So Charles is saying, we need to all band together and encourage each other. I am weak, we are weak. So the more we could avoid, let's do that to help. All right, so I have a text that um, I will share to you. First Timothy chapter five, verse two. All right, so this is Paul, all right, encouraging Timothy. Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters in all purity. All right? Now, what I get from this particular text is a sort of a, a basis for how we conduct or what is the relationship you would have with different persons in your um, society so you encourage the older guy the older man as you would a father the younger men as they were your brothers older women as your mothers and younger women as sisters in all purity so once you have this sort of mindset you will not well temptation is less likely to um, make its way into your um, mind because you, you have a renewed view of persons of the opposite sex, no matter the age, all right? So this is, this, is the, this is the sort of renewing of your mind. Nicola, do you like to read that text that you see in there while I find it? The text that I'm seeing you highlighted there. Oh, in the chat. In chat, in chat. Yes. So there's First Corinthians chapter six, verse eighteen. This that this person highlighted: flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. And the second text that this person highlighted was Second Timothy chapter two, verse twenty-two: flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith charity peace with them that call on the lord out of a pure heart i think also to highlight with these is um as a, a lesson pointed out was the danger of indulgence so um as these are saying they say to flee both texts started off with flee run from these things flee from these things don't find yourself anywhere near these things. Because to be honest, I'm sure we know that temptation is not a joke. <laughs> um, it's very real. Yeah, run with about five U's and like six, seven N's. Run from these things, flee from these things. Because, and I'm just going to read what it says, where David was concerned. Um, we know that he had like six, seven wives. He had a, yeah, he didn't right. have one. Yeah. Right. Look, look, um, look, I highlighted it here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. Oh, where, oh, yeah. And David grew stronger and stronger while the house of Saul became weaker and weaker. And sons were born to David at Hebron. His firstborn was Amnon, Amnon <laughs> of Ahinoam and Jezreel. And his second, Shiliab of Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. And the third, Absalom, the son of Machah, the daughter of Tal, my king of Geshur. And the fourth, Adonijah, the son of Haggith. And the fifth, Shephatiah, the son of Abital, and the sixth, Ithriam of Egla, David's wife. These are born to David in Hebron. So, like, of all, all those children seemingly had a different mom. Um, David engaging in in something that we know that that isn't according to God's will, because you, we know that God wants one man, one wife. And I think with David indulging in something as having more than one wife, um, he lusted after Bathsheba, as it says. He already had more than six wives and who knows how many concubines. And yet that was not enough. And worse to satisfy his lust, he had to take another man's wife. So the important principle is that any deviation from the will of God opens a soul up to more and more folly and deception. By transgressing God's law, David opened himself to 
more temptation. The indulgence of a passion, far from removing the passion, only makes the passion stronger and stronger. So in terms of the statistics on youth, um, the engagement of youth in pornography, whether intentional or unintentional, and even in modern couples engagement with extramarital affairs, I think the danger of indulgence. So if you accidentally saw um, some pornographic content while doing some schoolwork or doing some work and then you're like no i'm not watching this but then as uncle Dwayne pointed out the movies even sometimes the games that are out there those things and you allow yourself little by little to behold these things you allow yourself to indulge in these things in small ways it will continue to grow because there's a text that says if you're faithful in the least you'll be faithful in the much and it also <laughs> You can think of it that way as it applies to this as well. If you indulge in a little bit, you're solely training and preparing yourself to, to indulge in worse and greater things. And the passion that's behind it will continue to grow as you continue to do it. So doing something small just opens the door for you to do with something that's uh, much worse. And in this case with David, from having a bunch of wives to sleeping with someone that wasn't your wife and then murdering someone to cover it up. And that is very um, noteworthy that it's actually small steps that progress and accumulate over time into one well, big sin. We know that we knew that David deviated from God's plan, one man, one wife. And <laughs> he took his kingship um, privileges to the extreme, right? So on top of having these six wives, a Another wife was um well he wanted another wife and I showed some I showed a text I highlighted a text a while ago about he also had concubines right but it's not it wasn't him simply acquiring another another wife it 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 seemed as though he needed something with more of a thrill and the, I guess the thrill was that it was someone else's um, spouse, right? And you see the, just look at the progression, right? Yeah, it wasn't supposed to be home, right? You were supposed to be at war. Um, so it, that was your first mistake. The next mistake, you keep looking, <laughs> right? So he kept looking and he considered her beauty right so i i don't know i don't know what is the um how many milliseconds does it take to consider uh, somebody's beautiful but knowing david as the descriptive poet as he <laughs> he probably was looking a long time right now he he rationalized that this beauty okay it, it this is not this is someone who's beautiful on top of it, he asks for his advisors to inquire of the state, the um, the relationship status of our lady here, right, Bathsheba. And shouldn't I be reading um a text just to, um to back this up now? Oh no! Right. So yeah. So the progression. He found out that he was um Uriah's wife, and. Uh, verse 3 in chapter 11. You can use that. Yeah. Chapter what? Chapter 11, verse 3. three. Like verses two, 2 to 3, kind of. No, verse 3. Yeah. Right. So you found out that it was Uriah's wife. Uh, yeah, Uriah's wife. I'm saying that correctly. And he, he literally. Oh, right. No, I feel we're supposed to go back. Yeah, this is it. This is it. This is it. All right. Okay. All right. So, so basically, he called for her. He knew that she was someone else's um wife, and he went through with the act. When he found out that she was pregnant, he he didn't stop to think that he he did something wrong, but he tried to cover it up. And I think that is the um. He sure that broke the camel back. So he, he moved from one temptation. He moved from adultery to now becoming not only a liar, 
but also a murderer. All right? So I think that um, with any kind of addiction, whether it be sexual or otherwise, it, it sort of opens the door to break more than one commandment. And that, that's just basically a danger. So I, 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 I think when dealing with, especially with sexual temptation, it cannot isolate it to a sexual act alone. Um, basically, they want to be occupied. They want to make sure you have enough hobbies, all of that. Why nobody talking? <laughs> No, well, we're listening to you. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, like, I just waiting for somebody to say, "May I excuse you?" Oh, um, and, uh, well, I so. mean, let me let me grant your wish. May I excuse you? I just wanted to highlight um, what somebody on YouTube said. They pointed at Daniel chapter one verse eight, but Daniel purposed in his heart, "Do not imagine illicit scenarios, but plan to stand at every scenario." Don't leave the other person wondering about your position, not even for a few seconds. And I think they're saying that in direct response to engaging with another person where extramarital affairs or um, uh, being unfaithful or inappropriate in certain circumstances stand. Um, keep purpose in your heart and don't leave the other person worrying about it. And then um, somebody else gave us the exact number of why the David had it was eight. Thank you so, so much. We appreciate that. I think something that's really interesting to note is um, the differences between David and Uriah. Um, Uriah's actions versus David David's actions when he attempted to cover up his sin and cover up his wrong. Um, if we look at Second Samuel chapter 11, verse 8, um, when Bathsheba had told David that she was pregnant. Um, and David was like, oh, dear, we need to we need to fix the situation. The differences in um, the two men's response to the opportunity to go to, to home to his wife in the time of war. Um, Uriah said, I'm reading from my Bible, the NIV. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace and a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all of his master's servants and did not go down to his house. I'm continuing on. David was told Uriah did not go home. So he asked Uriah, haven't you just come from a military campaign? Why didn't you go home? Uriah said to David, and this is uh, a part that I really want to highlight, the ark in Israel and Judah are staying in tents. And my commander Joab and my Lord's men are camped in the open country. How could I go to my house to eat and drink and make love to my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. And already you see um, taking a, a little break from the um, sexual immorality and whatnot. Um, the differences at that point in time in not only the discipline, but the values of both men. David was the king of Israel, and for some reason, he hadn't gone out to war. But Uriah, a simple soldier, he was called for more, not knowing why, and he's offered the opportunity to go home. And this guy seems to be more noble than David was showing himself to be in this chapter. He's like, the ark is intense. My commander is fighting. Why would I go home to sleep in my, with my wife when so many other things are, are, are going on um, while other people aren't enjoying this kind of comfort? And I think that's, that's something that's, um, to me, it, it struck out to me, the differences between the two men in this regard, um, where David had faltered and being at home and allowing himself to fall into temptation, whereas Uriah, being at home, he um, be he went to war, and even when he was at home, his heart was with the people that were fighting out there. I think it was a, a big contrast between David and, and Uriah there. I want to share this text here, James um, chapter one, verse twelve to fifteen. Blessed is a man who remains steadfast on the trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to who love him. Let no one say when he's tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. 
and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So that text there in James sort of like breaks down the progression and the end result or the outcome of when we follow a particular path, it will lead to an unfortunate death. But we know that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, which is what David did, right? So um, I'm trying to look for that creating me a clean heart. I believe that 51 is 10. 51 10, yeah. So we have David's confession here. There's hope, right? When David um, said, create in me a clean heart and renew the right spirits within me. Why does the Bible say that David was a man after God's own heart? I'll look for that text. It's because he actually confessed. <laughs> he asked for a new spirit to be renewed within him. Okay, so we have a comment. You could go ahead. You could raise it. That's in the hand raise. You could unmute. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, actually it came in exactly when I was thinking about that same point uh, about um, David being a man man after God's own heart, right? Uh, a text that came to mind was um the one that says, you know, he that thinks he stand, take heed lest he fall, right? Because, you know, we would look back at these these um Bible stories, true stories, and we'd be like, but how could David do this? How could the son do that? But it's only when we grow older and get in certain situations and scenarios, we realize that when we get into these positions, we would do that and worse, right and um also a point to note was that um in reading with our uh, sister white uh, like to call her auntie ellen <laughs> um in some of her writings i remember her mentioning that you know when david was specifically called a man after god's own heart was before um these incidents incidences right and what happened is i i still take your point too in that because he was originally a man after God's own heart, he remembered his foundation. You know, he remembered how deep his relationship with God was. And that is what eventually led him to um, repentance. And Psalm 51 is a real, um, how to say, it's like a vulnerable text in that it really, he, he comes honest to God, you know. He ain't saying it like, you know, he's trying to justify anything anymore. He comes straight up and he, he's asking God to cleanse him, you know. So we just need to be careful because we could think that, you know, that's just the Bible. That wouldn't happen to me. <laughs> and then when it comes our way, we would just be sweeped up in the flood of uh, of all the craziness so if we if we if we looked at some of the um the icebreaker questions after a tiring exercise session and gym instructor office they drop and you see, you see the progression of the the hands moving like that is one of the typical scenarios in which sexual temptation might manifest itself in our modern day life no yeah yeah and it can sweep in very subtle too you know at first you'll be like oh nothing is wrong with this or nothing is wrong with that until like you say you know uh you don't see it until it actually hits you <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah i think um something that for, as uncle Dwayne said with david so willingly repenting i think in same psalm 51 i can't recall the exact verse but it goes i acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me and he acknowledged his sin but something that else that i, I wanted to Oh dear. Um, brethren, we do apologize for the inappropriate commentary in the chat. Um, 63 Adel on YouTube said it would be an interesting reunion between Uriah, Bathsheba, and David at the second coming. I am looking forward to heaven and all love and forgiveness that will be there. Um, 100%. But something I want to kind of touch on is the consequences of David's sin. Yes, he did repent. Yes, he's described as a man after God's own heart, but that does not mean that sin does not have consequences because yes, God forgives, but there are consequences for our actions, which is why God doesn't want us to do them in the first place. And in this case, the son that Bathsheba was pregnant with because of David's adultery, her and David's adultery, um, passed away. Um, and you would think like, it was an innocent child. The child really had nothing to do with this entire thing. He was a product of something. Why did he have to die? And I wanted to 
read a quote from a lesson that said, it's hard to understand why an innocent baby should suffer for sins he had nothing to do with, but this is the horrible nature of sin. It leads to the suffering of others, even those who might have had nothing to do with the sin. How many spouses and children have suffered terribly because of the sin of adultery committed by a parent? Sin never happens in isolation. Sooner or later, in one way or another, the consequences appear. And so where the statistics with um, the extramarital affairs and marriages, or even with children who are exposed to pornographic content, um, you may think this is something you're doing by yourself. This is something you're making a choice to do because your mind maybe in that moment is on you. But when the effects come and the consequences come, you re um, especially in families, you'll realize that you're not the only person who's being affected. Your spouse is being affected because they're hurt that you may have done this thing to them. Your children are affected because they have to navigate how to deal with um, their parents going through this rough change time. Change of behavior as well a change of behavior as well so i think it's important to note that in david's in david's story though he repented though he asked god for forgiveness and he was forgiven to the point where he was called a man after god's own heart later in the future it's we have to remember that there are consequences to sin and that those consequences are hardly ever felt in isolation your actions affect yourself and those around you and i think um even in avoiding sexual temptation today, people should often remember that. Um, it's not just about you. Um, it's about the God you're representing and the people who you can hurt around you as well. All right, so I, I just wanted to um, <clears throat> reiterate what Duane said. David was called a man after God's own heart before he said, right? Um, so Acts 13, 22, and when... He had removed him, so he raised up David to be king of, king, of whom he testified and said, I have found David and the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. Right? And it is God's will that none of us should perish, but we should all come. To there's, a, there's a text in James chapter 2, I believe. James, James 2. As in the reasons for God's um, patience. No, it's Romans chapter 2. Oh, hold, uh, I don't know if y'all you you remember the text. The text that says, um, do you not think that the reason for God's patience is not not um, to lead us all to repentance? Okay, let me, let me, let me, let's look for it in a, in a few. You could say a couple of words. Yeah, no problem. Um. I think he said, Uncle Dwayne said Acts 13, verse 22 in the chat there as well. Nice, no, right here in Romans. Wait, no, sorry. Oh, yeah, the Acts one is the one he did already. That was a really good one. All right, this is it, yeah? Yeah. Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Well, let's read from 3. Do you suppose, oh man, you who judge, who practice things, and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume, presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? So we may ask ourselves, why didn't God um, smite David down in that instance? But it's like the reason why God is long-suffering, why God doesn't strike us down when we commit such horrible acts, it's because it is meant to lead us to repentance so th that would be my final um, contribution does anybody else have any final contributions on this topic i do have a final contribution i think something that we hadn't touched on yet is um the continuity of this mistake i think um before i go to david um we can think of with <clears throat> Abraham's descendants, uh, the two who are fighting over a guy um, or who wanted children and they use their handmaids, trouble ensued in certain things or lying about your wife, how Abraham had fallen those mistakes and you saw it kind of repeated in the generation after him. And with David, where with his mistake with um, or his temptation or his 
thorn in the flesh with lust um, and his mistake with Bathsheba, how his son Amnon with the sister, how that played out. I think especially where children are concerned or generations after um, as Christians and as people, and even I'm not a parent, but even in the context of parents, um, be careful what you do, because I don't, I think, you want your good actions to be repeated in the generations that come after you, but you don't want your children com um, committing the same mistakes that you've committed. And with David's generation, and even with Abraham's generation, there are certain sins, certain mistakes that we saw repeated in them, sometimes the results of them being much worse than that of the person who initially committed the sin. So I think um, again, keeping in mind how our sins and the effects of them can affect other people, keep in mind the generations that are to come. And just reading the comment on, on YouTube from Sister Henry, his guilt, I presume she means David, David's guilt led him to repentance. When we fall, we should fight Satan's suggestions to hide, keep away from church or blame others, but encourage others not to fall as we did. His grace is sufficient. I think I'm done there, yeah. All right, so you wanna um <clears throat> okay at this point in time we're gonna have a special prayer and we sort of designated someone to um, pray so at this time you could come forth and lead this session. Okay, hi everyone. We have definitely been having a very uh, special, um, AY indeed, excellent, uh, excellent input from both YouTube and Zoom. So with everything that was said today, let's just uh, pause at this time to ask God's strength. Heavenly Father, we looked at David's life today. First, we looked at, you know, how he was able to overcome battling such a huge giant like Goliath. And while there are many things in our lives, there are situations in our lives that seem to be large, that seem to be over nine feet large. And we are given these stories so that we can be reminded of the fact that when things look impossible, the God of the impossible could come through for us. So God, we pray that you will come through and you will increase our faith and you will help us to believe that you can fight every single battle for us, God. We pray for the generation of young people in these last days, this final generation, this GYC, this generation of youth for Christ, that we will stand up and we will just have that increased faith to go out there and to spread the three angels messages in these last days and also lord to be able to be overcomers to be victorious over every single sin even this lustful um lustful sins of the flesh lord even when the enemy will you know surround us with all kinds of sexual temptations and all other temptations that are combined with and connected to sexual content lord we place it in your hands once again we pray that we will have a bonfire where we will just remove those things from our lives that are distracting us and those things that are leading us to break not only the seventh commandment, but the principle of it in 1 Corinthians 6 and other places, uh, T Timothy and other places that says flee youthful lust. Lord, we know in the situation of Joseph that we studied some time back, he had to run, he had to run from the situation and because david was placed as was rightly said by the sister earlier because he placed himself in a situation and in a setting in which he shouldn't have been in the first place he fell so lord help us in 2022 and beyond that we will be overcomers, we will be victorious, we will stand firm. Lord, we pray for the young people that took over AY today, such an excellent program. God, we pray that, you know, whatever situations they have as well, whatever temptations they have, whatever temptations we have, that we will be overcomers. God, strengthen us all young and also young at heart those who tune in on youtube bless them and their family god and those of us over here on zoom as well strengthen your church strengthen your people and help us to get ready for your soon coming in jesus name amen
Amen. 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 <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> these are the final comments. Um, so today's program was David. Giant faith, giant fall. We we unlocked and looked at the life of David through the eyes of well, at the particular instance of him fighting or facing Goliath and how he fell with Bathsheba. And we, we tried to engage the congregation or participants online here on Zoom as well as on YouTube. And if you didn't realize, it was a sort of advanced draw swords <laughs> in a sense, right? So we, 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 we we wanted to encourage all our fellow members to always consult the scripture to make sure we, we know where all our um all our opinions are generated from and let's, let's keep the practice of verifying and backing up all your um your statements and references so that you will be representing the Lord as best as you possibly can. All right, so, so it was a pleasure being your host today. I'll pass you on to, I guess, back to doing if he has any announcements to make, right? All right, so goodbye. Oh, yes. Have a blessed week, everyone. We want to thank the, the youth that took AY today. It was excellent, really, really fruitful. fruitful. Uh, well, there are so many, so many uh, youthful events coming up this weekend and into August. Uh, national sports, get ready. By the grace of God, August 21st is National Sports. So keep that in mind. Sunday, August 21st is National Sports Fun and Family Fellowship Day. We have a few more things. August 7th will be beach games. Those who know about it, take part. Um, a few other things coming up from the youth department as well. You'll hear as we continue along with planning. So have a blessed week, everyone. Take care. Be blessed. Last we call, great program, nice worship. Bye. Bye. Yeah.